So a couple of uh, weeks ago, might even be a couple of months ago at this stage, um, a thing came up on my news feed about a band that I hadn't heard about in years, a band called Millie Vanilli. Now, for all of you of my vintage, you'll have heard the name. Anybody younger might not have. Probably haven't. Okay, very good. I was, I was actually quite young when they were around. And I, I'm always interested in the lives of stars, not like my mom who, who loved Hello Magazine back in the day, but I, I, like, I like looking at the lives of uh, rich and famous people to see what actually happened, you know, once the fame kind of subsided or once they became famous, uh, but then maybe weren't in the public eye as much. What actually, what did they do with all the millions? You know, what actually happened? Because we have this idea that once a person reaches the pinnacle of their success, be it sporting, in their sporting career, uh, in singing, dancing, whatever it may be, acting, that once they're a millionaire, they're sorted, all is good. It's just, you know, cruising home until then, you know, uh, everything is fine. <clears throat> the reality is often very, very different, and that, that interests me. So I just remember, I remember this, this band, Millie Vanilla. I remember the name, couldn't remember any of their songs. Uh, I had a look at them, they're interesting. It's uh, late 80s, it's when synthesizers had just been invented, so it all it sounds really, really fake now. But anyway, okay, so, I had a quick look at, uh, at this story, um, which, which came up on, on my feed, and uh, had a read through it. And there was a whole, as one of the guys here would say, a whole hoo-ha behind this one particular band, right? So um, these two guys, Rob and Fab, uh, one from Munich and one from Paris, met at a dance seminar, right? And they, they hit it off immediately, and they got on really well, and they danced a bit together, came up with a couple of moves, and formed a band called Milli Vanilli. Right? Great. Uh, Dancing-wise, they were great. Singing-wise, not really top drawer. Uh, so they, they, they had a, a, a little album, but it didn't do much. Uh, and they were actually quite poor. Right? They were actually living in, in uh, dodgy parts of the city because they just couldn't afford anything. Okay, in Munich. Uh, well, Munich has some very small dodgy parts, not very many. But um, anyway, so... Uh, then a producer, a guy by the name of Frank, up in Frankfurt, it's easy enough to remember, um, uh, came across them and he saw them perform and he said, you guys can, you know, you've got this, you've got this attitude and this stage presence and I also have some good songs from guys who have good voices but no stage presence. So how about you do the dancing and all that kind of thing and we use their vocals? Uh, the guys, the Millie Vanilli said, okay, sure, we'll, we'll, we'll start with that, and then eventually, of course, we'll move on to our own stuff. The guy, Frank, said, yeah, sure, sure, no problem, or whatever, yeah, let's see. So, voila, they produce uh, an album called All or Nothing, should sound familiar to us. Uh, another reason it kind of struck me, All or Nothing, like, Saint, like Sister Claire Crockett. All or Nothing, and it went, in modern day terms, it went viral. It was very, very popular uh, here in Europe and over in America. Uh, so it became a, a huge sensation. Very good. Okay. During a couple of interviews, though, journalists noticed that their English wasn't fantastic, even though the songs were all in English. Their English wasn't fantastic. So they're wondering, did they, did they really write these? Cause, or they have a script writer somewhere. There's something, there's something off here. All was more or less okay until in 1989. So they, they formed the year before in 88. In 1989, they were performing live at an MTV event. And at all of their events, they'd have to lip sync. So you've got your microphone, you're doing all the kind of the things, but nothing's coming out of your mouth, all right? Uh, so they were at a live event at MTV, and the disc that the song was on started to skip. Now, you could imagine you're out on stage, and you, your mic isn't even turned on. So you, you can't pick up from where the vocals left off. You're not even, it's not even turned on. <laughs> the, the, the track just kept skipping. It just kept skipping, just kept skipping. And the guys are out there in front of a huge stage, live in Connecticut, going, <laughs> what do we do now? Like? So actually, they ran off stage in shame. Okay? Then the producers kind of pushed them back on. And uh, next song, and away they went. But then the scandal blew. It went ballistic. You guys are fakes. You're imposters. What you do isn't real, and you've no real talent. They won a Grammy for their album, All or Nothing, 
which then they had to give, well, the, the association asked for it back and they duly gave it back. Uh, certain people from the States then start to sue them because on the album it said uh, vocals and lyrics by Millie Vanilli, Rob and, and Fab, uh, which was untrue. Okay? Then the real singers from the band, well, if you will, the, the, vocal, the vocalists behind the band said, yeah, actually, we want our cut because it, it was actually us doing all the singing, so we're, the, you know, we're that good. And the whole thing just went crazy. It was just a really embarrassing uh, experience for the guys. And it actually, a couple of years, about 10 years later, one of the guys actually committed suicide. Okay. But what, what it really struck home when I was reading through all of this was, was an idea that, that uh, has definitely crossed my mind on occasion. And it's the idea of being an imposter, you know, of feeling fake. I'm not sure if, if you've had that experience, maybe as a parent or as a teacher or as a priest or as a per any person with responsibility, you might often feel like a fake, right? And there's this interesting thing called imposter syndrome, right? Which refers to the internal experience of believing that you're not as competent as people perceive you to be, right? An imposter syndrome. So that you're, you, it's this belief this uh, experience of believing that you're not as competent as people think you are. So people think, oh, they, they must be incredible, they're amazing, look at them, they're such a fantastic young person, such a fantastic priest, doctor, nurse, parent, whatever it is. And then deep down in yourself, you know, I actually, I'm not 100% sure what I'm doing all the time. Um, I'm not, I wouldn't say I'm winging it, but uh, I'm not as confident as people think. Or maybe, in order to appear confident, um, I always drive home my opinion. Do you know what you need to do now, right? According to my vast experience, do you know what? You, you need to sit down, right? And, <laughs> you know, so we say what we say with loads of confidence to back up the fact that I haven't a clue. You know? But we, we get this persona of, right? So, so, yeah, I, I see, I understand, okay? I understand, and so what you need to do is, but deep down you're like, oh, I don't know, I don't know what they have to do. I can't fix their problem, I don't know. You know, so it's, it's interesting how this, this uh, imposter syndrome, right, how it's, it might be more prevalent in us than, than we believe. I know up here, like when, when I have to preach, like when I'm preaching, I'm preaching first and foremost, sorry, for me. Because <laughs> all these things that I read and say, I have to live. I have to live them. So if I'm calling people on to, to, to pray more, forgive more, I have to pray more. I have to forgive more. There's a story of a, a mom who brought her son to uh, Mahatma Gandhi, right? And she said, uh, Mr. Gandhi, Ga for Sir Gandhi, Gandhi man. <laughs> your your Gandiness, whatever, whatever the whatever the term is, you know. Um, Dearly beloved, <laughs> so can you tell my son to stop eating so much sugar, all right? He goes home and he just gets sugar and sugar and just eats sugar and his teeth are rotting out and this would have been in India, so dentists might have been a bit difficult to get to. Um, so just stop, tell him to stop eating sugar, all right? And Gandhi turns to the mom and says, come back to me in a week. And she says, I just, I just queued here for ages to talk to you. And he says, Come back to me in a week. So a week later, she gets into the queue again and she gets through and she gets up to him and she says, okay, as, I'm not doing this again. So, dear Mahatma Gandhi, uh, can you tell my son to stop eating so much sugar? And he turns to the son and says, can you stop eating so much sugar? And then she said, why didn't you just tell him last week? And he said, well, if I'm going to tell your son to go off sugar, then I had to go off sugar for a week. You know, in order to not be an imposter, I have to live what I'm asking you to do. I have to live what I'm asking you to do. So, like, this is the, the, as I said, the experience of, of parents as well, where, where children invariably look up to parents, and, and it, this, it's good that we do. It's good that we do. You know, when we're, when we're young, like, our parents are massive. And they know everything, because you ask them everything. How does a pen work? How does a, how, where are we going in the car? What day is today? Are those my shoes? I mean, like, you, know, you ask them everything, and they know everything, 
right? Or at least you think they do, until you get to your teenagers, and in teenage years, and then they, they don't know nothing, all right? But, uh, but when you're young, like your parents, you think they know absolutely everything. And there's a, a very profound movie called Ant-Man, where uh, there's a, a, char a character in it who's a bit of a thief, and his daughter idolizes him, but he's a thief. And the ex-wife, so Ant-Man, the character, his wife and their daughter, they split up, all right? And then she, the, the mom says to Mr. Ant-Man, the thief, be the father she thinks you are. Be the father that she thinks you are. And when I heard that, I went, ooh, that's good. That's good. Because I hear that for myself as well. Be the priest people might think you are. Be the parent, be the doctor, be the young person, be the missionary, be the farmer <laughs> that people might think you are. They might see the Sacred Heart picture in your living room and go, Jane, they're, they're, they're shock and holy. Well, be shock and holy. Be selfless. Be giving. In our readings today, uh, there's, there's a lot going on. So we've got St. Paul who went from persecuting the church as Saul to being one of its greatest missionaries and most prolific authors in the New Testament. So I would imagine that him and maybe people like St. Peter, maybe the apostles in general, would have felt this, this uh, almost fakeness within them at times, as in they would have known either I persecuted the church or I left Jesus when he needed me. St. Peter would have known, he would have always remembered. I actually denied him. In his moment of greatest need, I was not there. And while th these things always have to be balanced, we don't, we, don't, we, don't want to, we don't want to stay stuck in our misery, but a healthy awareness of our own weakness is good. A healthy awareness of our own inability is good. If we dwell on it, that leads us to depression. If we don't recognize it at all, we get proud. So a, a balance, a healthy recognition, I need God. In our second reading from St. John, whoever keeps his commandments lives in God and God lives in him. So our, our identity in, in God, it's, it's, there are many ways of phrasing it. You can, you can say like we're, we're inhabited by God. We're a temple of the Holy Spirit. We are children of God. Our most fundamental identity is that in virtue of our baptism, we are children of God. So I can, I can make mistakes, but ultimately I'm, I'm, I'm a child of God now. Live as a child of God. If people think that we, we have it all together, we, we should do our best to actually have it all together. To be the person of prayer people think we are. To be the wonderful young person that people think we are. And to, to not, 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 again, it's always, it's always a question of balance. Don't, not to dwell in our failures, but to recognize them at the same time so that we don't get ahead of ourselves. And in all of this, in all of this becoming what God has created us to be, his children, we do so with our effort and God's grace. And these two always go together. God's grace and our effort, our effort and God's grace. It's a fallacy to say, God will just do everything. No, he won't. He gave you a brain and a heart, intellect and will. Use them. So God wants to work with you, not instead of you. Just like all good parents will not feed their children with the spoon at when the child is 16. The child can do it. The mom can also feed them. But there comes a time, Johnny, when you have to start feeding yourself. Okay, I can't come into school every single lunchtime and feed you your lunch. Okay, grow up. So it's a fallacy to say God will simply just, he'll just do everything. No, he, he'll work with you. He will work with you, not instead of you. He'll work alongside you. He'll strengthen you, absolutely. Inspire you, absolutely. Pick you up when you've fallen, absolutely. But he's not going to annihilate your will and just do it in, in spite of you. 
That's not the way it works. The, the church has always been renewed through saints, so people who made decisions and did things inspired by God. So that's why this reality of, of our gospel. I am the true vine. My father is the vine dresser. Each branch in me that bears no fruit, he cuts away. And each branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it bears even more. Make your home in me as I make mine in you. As a branch, i.e. you, as a branch cannot bear fruit all by itself, but must remain part of the vine, neither can you unless you remain in me. I am the vine, says Jesus. You are the branches. Whoever remains in me, with me in him, bears fruit in plenty. For cut off from me, you can do nothing. Nothing. Cut off from me, you can do nothing. So you see, we, we, don't, we don't want to be fakes. We don't want to be uh, just, kind of ca- just Catholic in name or just going to Mass or just praying. Or, we, don't, we, we want to live this, the, the deepest aspect, the deepest part of our relationship with God that we can. We want to be all that we can be, also in our faith. You know, it, it, it's, ordin- it, it's common that in uh, sports or academics or in any other field, people want to be all that they can be. But in spirituality, we're generally happy to just settle for getting over the line. But let's, let's, let's excel also in our faith. And not just yeah, have this kind of semi-imposter syndrome thing where, yeah, I mean, I go to Mass, but like, I don't believe what the church says here, there, and there, and I've sinned this way, that way, and the other way, and I have no intention of giving up that bad habit and that bad habit. And so you're Catholic, but you're, you're not. It's all just so compromised and polluted that it's fake. Well, from today on, fake no more. Let's be real. Let's be real in our relationship with the Lord. What needs to change, what needs to be pruned, let us let the Lord prune it. What needs to grow, let us let the Lord allow it to grow. And all the while, in this reality that I am a child of God, that's not fake. That's a profound spiritual reality that we will spend all of eternity deepening and understanding. No more fakeness. No more imposter syndrome. Let us live hand in hand with God the Father. Let us allow him to work in us and through us. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Whoever remains in me, with me in him, bears fruit in plenty. For cut off from me, you can do nothing. Amen.